Is it too late? I don't think so. Um, as we would say, the hardest thing is to know. And once you know, to have the will to make an effort. We are unnecessary loss of life and suffering if we are not able to get a grapple on the situation. When we look back at the most pressing health issues of our time, HIV, COVID-19 and NCDs are sure to top that list. But today, there may be another threat looming, one that affects us all. Antimicrobial resistance, or AMR. It's a silent threat lurking in the agricultural and health sectors. To shed some light on this important issue is Senior Medical Officer of Health at the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Dr. Leslie Wallach. She explains what are antimicrobials. These are medicines that are used to treat infections in humans, animals, or plants that are caused by bacteria or funguses or viruses. And what is antimicrobial resistance and why is it a key issue? Mm -hmm. When um, the bacteria or viruses or funguses are no longer susceptible to these medicines that are used to treat the infections, that is called antimicrobial resistance. And that is an issue because the infections, if they're not treatable, can kill the person or the, or the animal. The treatments that would then normally have been treated by, say, a cheap uh, medication now require more expensive medications to treat. And then there are some functions that have to be covered by antibiotics that may no longer be possible. For example, persons that are on chemotherapy or have received a transplant, their immune systems are depressed so that an infection that they would normally be able to fight off on their own, they're not able to, and they need medications to clear the infection. And if these medications are no longer useful, then a simple infection that they should have been able to fight off or to treat cheaply could kill them. There's also something called antimicrobial cross resistance. What we have noticed is that um, some agents, ba ba bacteria or viruses, are resistant to a particular antibiotic using a particular mechanism. For example, they, they push the antibiotic out of the cell or they modify the protein that the antibiotic would have used to get into their cell, something like that. Once that mechanism exists, it also works for every other um, medication in that class so that a particular bacterium may be resistant to all penicillins because it's worked out a mechanism that penicillins no longer work. And uh, a part of cross-resistance is that because that mechanism is also active in another class of antibiotics, that second class of antibiotics no longer work. So for some um, infections, you can't use penicillins, and then you can't use another class called cephalosporins because they work the same way um, to kill off the bacteria. There's a tendency here in Barbados where people overuse antibiotics. Why should this practice be discouraged? When we go to the doctor with a fever and a runny nose, maybe a cough, sore throat, a lot of the time that is a virus. Antibiotics are not helpful against viruses. So the only treatment that should be necessary is for symptoms, treat these sore throats, treat the fever, treat the body pains and our body's immune system will get rid of the virus by itself in about seven to ten days. So using an antibiotic to treat a virus is unnecessary and antibiotics then will be over prescribed. Also, there are situations where persons, usually males, um, have an indwelling urinary catheter. When they go to get that catheter changed, sometimes there's protein in the urine most catheter changes do not need antibiotics. Uh, all that is necessary is to flush the catheter, flush the bladder, and sometimes acidify the urine um, 
an infectious disease doctor has told me sometimes cranberry juice drinking or vitamin C could acidify the urine and help flush the bladder for that catheter change. So routinely covering catheter change with antibiotics is over prescribing. Similarly, using third level or restricted antibiotics because we know they will work. I mean, it's like using a restricted antibiotic to cover um, a routine infection, what may be just uh, a bacterial infection following influenza because the person can afford to pay for an IV injection. That's wrong. And that over-prescribing of antibiotics also um, increases the pressure towards anti antimicrobial resistance, and that is also over-prescribing, misuse of antibiotics. Dr. Rolla explains how antimicrobial resistance is developed and disseminated. Antimicrobial resistance is a normal process. All of us, humans, bacteria, viruses, funguses, everybody's trying to survive. So there are some things that will kill. Use an antibiotic, it will kill most of the, well, some, usually most of the, um, the pathogen. It will also kill off a lot of the normal flora in the gut and the other places in the body. But we are using it to kill the pathogens. Most of them will die, and a few of them will be left around for our immune system to mop up. If the, we use a lot of antibiotics, the susceptible ones will die, and the non-susceptible ones will continue to multiply. So the more and more antibiotics we use, the more and more what's left are the resistant, anti, uh, the resistant organisms then, uh, microbes. And um, because they are trying to survive, these, um, whatever we use, the bacteria or the viruses or the funguses will try to find a way to get around the agent and continue their existence. You would be aware um, that when penicillins were first discovered in the, around the 50s, 1950s, um, that they were a godsend. They helped treat syphilis, gonorrhea, lots of things, streptococcus, the things that were killing off um, persons in young age and persons um, in childbirth and all of that. Um, so they were, they were used as the saviors of, of human life and they allowed surgeries to be done and um, a lot of things that we are able to do now, transplants and um, caesarean sections and, and generally surgeries generally, um, use, use of antibiotics help. But the more antibiotics we use, the more pressure there is for the things we're using the antibiotics for to change, to try to avoid being killed off. Plants are also significantly impacted by antimicrobial resistance which endangers both their well-being and the world's agricultural ecosystem. The effectiveness of these preventative measures declines as bacteria, fungi and other microbes become resistant to frequently applied pesticides and fungicides. To tell us more is Senior Agricultural Officer at the Ministry of Agriculture, Michael James. I think normally people are concerned when they hear about antimicrobial resistance, they just think about uh, animals, uh, human beings, but antimicrobial resistance, indeed, as it says, means anything dealing with microbes. So there are microbes that also attack plants. And these microbes can be fungi. There are also bacteria that attack plants. Um, there are also things like nematodes, we call pathogens. But people normally just associate it with animals. So my veterinary colleagues, my colleagues in veterinary um, associations and so forth, they get all the, the hype. Whereas we, in plant protection, people tend to say, oh, no problem. But um, antimicrobials have been used in plant protection for years. So you have things like fungicides, you have insecticides, all of those are antimicrobial agents. You also have bacterial um, biological control agents, which are also used against the different pathogens. And for that, is, for that respect, also insects. Mr. James explains why antibiotics should never be used on plants. We do not use antibiotics in plants in Barbados. Let me repeat that very carefully. But antibiotics are not used in crops, plant crops, in Barbados. 
Now they've been used um, in other occasions in other parts of the world to control some um, bacteria that affect those particular plants. But in Barbados, we don't use them on crops. Um, so people should not fear that we use them here. However, antimicrobial resistance, as the name suggests, means that the particular uh, microbe, in our, in our sense, would be fungi or bacteria or nematodes or insects, can become resistant to a particular pesticide or chemical formulation that you have been using against these particular pests for years. Okay? So, what we want to let people know is that one of, the, one of our strategies, very simple, really and truly, our main one is exclusion. If the pests aren't here, we don't have to use anything to control it. All right? So, that's where plant quarantine comes in. If the pests do get in, then you have a number of different things that you can do. You can look at controlling them. In that sense, then we can use other insects or other fungi where that's where the biological control agents come in or you might be forced to use insecticides or fungicides. If used in plants, antibiotics could cause plant associated bacteria which could lead to AMR. This could subsequently spread to human pathogens and endanger human health through the food chain. This is why Mr. Jane strongly discourages the overuse of chemicals in plants. The problem is that people do overuse or abuse these particular chemicals. I'll give you an instance. If you keep on spraying a cockroach with the same spray over and over again, one of these days the cockroach might get, get up and walk away. All right? Because there's nothing that you can spray to a particular insect or whatever that you will kill all. So eventually there will be some that will survive. And that might be just 0.1%. However, that 0.1%, if you keep on using the same chemical all the time, over and over, will become resistant. And this is what we call breeding for resistance. So you're selecting this particular population because you keep on using the same chemical all the time. And once you select that population, they breed, they reproduce, and then that population then becomes the population, the main population. And this is where you get the resistance. Mr. James also identified some possible solutions that could be used to help to reduce the occurrence of AMR in plants. There are varieties that you can plant that comes with a tolerance or a resistance to particular pests. So you might find that, um, for instance, there might be a lettuce that have a particular resistance against a particular type of fungi or fungus. Then there might be certain um, crops that although an insect may um, infest it, the thing is that it cannot, it still will put up a certain amount of tolerance or resistance, so you can still get a yield in that particular crop. So you look at um, crops by breeding into that crop brands of resistance or tolerance. That's, that's the other one. Three, you can also look at how you rotate chemicals. So never use the same chemical. I mean, you know, you hear about brand names. Um, so a person might buy chemical A and say, okay, I switch it up with chemical B. But if they have the same active ingredient, you have not switched. You have switched names, but you're still using the same chemical compound to control the particular pests. And this is what happens because some people go up with brand names or it's working. So let's switch up, but they just switch up the chemical name the brand name before looking at the active ingredient. So know what you're spraying. You can rotate crops, just like how you rotate the chemicals, you rotate crops so that a particular pest does not get accustomed to that particular crop over and over again. As I tell people, some people say, oh, you know, I rotate, um, let's say, tomato, right? With sweet pepper but they're the same family. So what affects tomato is going to affect um, your sweet pepper. Or some person might say, you know, I rotate cucumber with squash. Hey, hey, they're the same family. So what affects cucumber will also affect squash. So rotating means you rotate out of the family of crops. So you rotate um, sweet pepper with something like corn or oat curl or something like that. So you, you change. So we, as the Minister of Agriculture, we always let persons know what's best to rotate. That rotation is part of it. You uh, make sure that you rotate your chemical. Follow the advice on the label. Do not 
if it says one teaspoon per gallon, don't put six teaspoons, you know, Bajans, we can kill it deader. You can't kill something deader, okay? So what you do, you make sure that you use the right dosage because if you overdose, that means that you are going to create much more quickly a population that is more tolerant and resistant to that particular pesticide. In the world of intensive farming, antibiotics are given to animals for growth and to prevent infections. But overuse breeds drug resistance bacteria. Could this animal issue become a human issue? Dr. Terence Mears explains. When farmers use these same antibiotics, and they don't use them at the, as I said, in, in those ways, the right antibiotic, the right dose, or in the right method, um, the organisms in the body can build up a resistance to it because it's not used appropriately to be able to either inhibit their spread or, in, or to more or less stop their growth altogether and terminate. So they then learn genetically wise, they start to build up a resistance or learn new pathways of which to process this antibiotic that you've put in to the animal. So then they, they can build up that resistance. Also, you can also have a problem where you've overdosed the animal or you've dosed the animal too close to when it's being slaughtered. So then that antibiotic, is, the residue is still in the animal and then that can cause a problem. So then the animal will then end up in the, the food chain with a small amount of antibiotics still present in the system. And then that will be a problem because then you eat the meat and then you can have that, that residual amount you're being consumed at more or less a low dose. In agriculture, farmers are encouraged to adopt alternative farming practices that minimize the need for antibiotics, promote good hygiene and enhance surveillance systems to track resistance patterns. It's important for farmers to keep animals well and healthy, but like humans, sickness is unavoidable. What should farmers do when the animals get sick? The advice is ideally your farmer should be aligned with a veterinarian and if there's uh, illness in the animal or he's detecting a problem, he should consult the veterinarian. Because most farmers tend to have um, an idea of what's going on. But sometimes what they're seeing and what is actually happening may be two different things. So you may have a one condition that mimics another condition, but they're different. So then the treatment will be different. So farmers tend to, some farmers here actually, tend to have their, their favorite antibiotic. Um, which they shouldn't have and shouldn't use unless they actually consult the veterinarian because they may use the incorrect antibiotic. They may also use the incorrect dose of that antibiotic. And they can also give the antibiotic in the wrong area. So not only are you or maybe overdosing or underdosing, you may be using the wrong product and you may give it in the wrong area which can actually cause another issue. It can cause damage to the muscles, damage to the veins, loss of function, or even death. Some people may argue that once meat is cooked at a high temperature, that should be enough to kill any bacteria. But is this the case with AMR? When you cook the meat, you do destroy a lot of the pathogenic organisms. And you don't just say you cook the meat, there's a specific temperature for a certain amount of time to get the meat um, in this, the safest manner possible. People will say that in the Caribbean, and particularly in Barbados, we will overcook the meat. So you tend not to get, as I said, either the viruses, the bacteria, or even the, um, the parasites in the meat because we, we kill the meat. We, we, we cook it very, very, <laughs> very well. And then it is the preparation of the meat too. When you lime and salt the meat, the preparation we do here, and then put on your seasonings, you're changing the pH balance of the meat and removing those organisms and so on from the surface and creating an unfriendly environment for them, right? So then the meat will be safer. With regard to the antimicrobials, which would be what you've injected into the animal, they can be residual still in the meat, depending on if it's heat stable, right? So the idea is to observe the withdrawal periods and not get to that stage. Hence, certain amount of testing is done in the abattoir and on samples that are submitted to us to look at the levels of what is present in the meat other than the actual meat itself.
it's also important for government to put restrictions in place to help to control the use of antibiotics. Right now there's a restriction. When we're bringing in our antimicrobials, because most of them are produced overseas, there's a, one or two labs here, like Carlisle Laboratories, that would make certain products here. So most of our um, antimicrobials are brought in. So the companies overseas like to know that we're registered and able to practice here before they even allow us to purchase items. So there's restrictions overseas to what you can get and the volume you can get. That's one. And two, I don't think we're in a position to be able to um, ban them. But what we can do is we do restrict certain, certain um, antimicrobials from being used on food, anim food producing animals. So you would limit the use. But banning would be detrimental because if you have a disease condition and you don't have the products here, then it, it, it would be a, a catastrophe. Fortunately, antibiotics are not the only way that we can treat illnesses. There are alternatives. People tend to use certain products. Um, the farmers will tell you that they will use different things to spray or treat the animals. More natural products like neem, garlic. So people will go more of those homeopathic remedies to be able to try and treat the animals. He also discusses whether antimicrobial use in farm animals is responsible for the spread of resistant bacteria. No, I will say a lot of people would say that, but when we have done our testing on the animals in the abattoirs and so on that come through, because we do do routine testing, um, we've only had like one or so case where the animals actually still had a low dose of the antimicrobials in them and we went and dealt with that situation and so on. It is a combined What's the word for it? It's regards to a uh, more holistic, where it's more inclusive of all the different things that people do, the antibacterial soaps, your toothpaste with triclosan, all those different, those are all antibacterial, and it, it does cause the growth of these super bugs, as you call them, and super organisms like the super molds that you will see growing because you've removed the bacteria which will compete the, the fungus and so on. So now you remove that, then you can get fungal infections and so on. So it's not the, the farm animals per se, um, at least not in, I would say in Barbados, it is um, sanitation, um, uh, decrease in like personal hygiene, and then the, the use of different products as well. Dr. Mears also addresses some of the changes that are expected to come into effect under the new legislation. The pesticides will fall on a different department. With regard to the, the antimicrobials, if you're talking about antibiotics, that will fall under the new legislation. So it will be under like veterinary services slash the drug service to be able to, to um, modulate that. As it is right now, anything labeled for veterinary use only under the old legislation did not have to be regulated. But now we're going to move past that so that there's better regulation of what's, what's being used and how it's being used. We also learn about the consequences for persons who violate this legislation. We haven't worked on that, on those as yet, but um, as it is right now, your access to those products will be very limited. So you, it'll be very hard for you to gain access to those, even if you try to bring them in from overseas your ability to purchase those overseas will be limited due to the uh, regulations in other countries which are following the similar regulations that we're doing right now. So everyone is moving towards um, more regulation to try and control the use of the antimicrobials because of the importance of it. Because as it is right now, we're running out of viable antibiotics or antimicrobials to use in certain situations where people have um, surgery or have an accident and so on, and you try to treat those conditions, you're getting very resistant um, organisms. And there is, it's getting to a stage where um, the earlier, as I said, the earlier, the, um, the more basic type antimicrobial agents were not working, so then you have different generations, second generation, third generation, fourth generation of these drugs, and some of them are not working. So that's, that's why we have to kind of take a step back and 
try to control the use so that then we can preserve um, those drugs for use when it is necessary. There's no denying the fact that Barbados is small, but every country, no matter the size, has an important role to play in this fight. And if we don't act now, the consequences could be unimaginable. If we, we don't get a grapple on under this situation, we will have a lot of microbes and organisms that we're unable to treat. And you have conditions like just basic pneumonia that people get, and people with asthma will sometimes get pneumonia and stuff like that. And you won't even be able to treat that. You have a car accident, and you have a, a broken bone or whatever, and you have a complications with that. You won't have the antibiotics to be able to treat that. Or you'll be using a whole slew of antibiotics, almost like a cocktail of them, to try and treat the problem, where you can just pick one. Um, that, that option will not be available. Yeah, yeah. It'd be an unnecessary loss of life and suffering if we're not able to get a grapple on the situation to be able to control the use of these antimicrobials. Antimicrobial resistance has the potential to harm many vulnerable people worldwide. But we can prevent this. We must work together to advocate for responsible use of antibiotics and, where possible, use alternatives. Remember, Knowledge and action are our best tools. So let's be wise and fight against the unnecessary use of antimicrobials before it's too late.